You are listening to Mining Stock Education, where you'll learn from the top leaders in the natural resource sector and uncover quality mining investment opportunities. Fertilizers as a whole, so uh, is 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 our most bullish for 20, uh, 2021. So we've got as a, as a sector as a whole, we've got prices increasing. I think by an average of um, of uh, low twenty percent as a whole on a global basis. In today's show, you are going to be hearing from Paul Robinson. He is a director with the CRU Group, and he has over 25 years of experience covering the commodity markets. If you attend PDAC like I do, Paul is often the keynote speaker talking about giving an overview of what to expect for the commodities markets in that upcoming year. I remember going in 2017 for the first time to that conference. It's the world largest mining conference, and Paul was the keynote speaker. So I'm bringing him on the show today to talk about a variety of commodities, many commodities which I don't pay attention to myself. But as a commodities investor, I want to know if there's a bullish sector that's about to be rising that I don't know about. I will, I'm looking to Paul today in this interview to alert me to that fact. So Paul, welcome back onto Mining Stock Education. Thanks, Bill. Thanks for the very kind introduction. And I will, I will do my best to um, inform you and inform your uh, listeners um, to the best of my ability. Thank you very much. Well, over the last week, uh, the whole topic of a silver squeeze has been popularized by the Wall Street Bets Reddit crowd. And I would like to get your perspective um, as you analyze this. Where do you see silver going and any thoughts on the last week of action in the silver price? Yeah, so let, let's think about the last week of action first, and then I'll move on to where the fundamentals might take us uh, towards the end of the year. Um, I mean, what I'd say is is clearly these retail investors are having an impact on the um, silver price. We saw it go up by something like 10% on uh, Monday morning. We saw it uh, retreat yesterday. If I'm honest, I've not looked at it today, but I'm sure there's more volatility there again. So, so they're having an impact and it can't be ignored. And the fact that this is the second asset class that this retail group have moved into, they've gone from equities into commodities, um, I think that will have a lot of institutional investors worried. Um, and they'll be worried about how they manage that risk going forward. And you know, it's your pension or uh, my pension at the end of the day that's in a lot of those funds. So, um, so um, it's not just a sort of um, Wall Street bank issue. In terms of commodities, I think there's a lot of parallels to be had with Chinese commodity markets, where we've also seen the impact of retail investors coming into individual commodities on the back of um, of, um, of stories. And so there we saw a lot of retail investment in nickel, in copper, in iron ore in recent times over the last few years. And there's a story that's followed every time. So you see sudden price surges. You see those being exacerbated then through momentum. Um, but unless there's physical hoarding, frankly, it leads to an inevitable price reversion because these are commodity markets. And at the end of the day, they do all tend to revert back to supply demand fundamentals. It's just a question of the time scale. And so fundamentally for silver, you know, we think that this sort of um, intervention will lead to the same outcome. You will at some point get a, um, a mean reversion back to what the fundamentals tell you, even with silver having that um, store of um, wealth element to it as well. So the questions you have to ask yourself looking at this is how big is the pool of capital that's willing to invest in this type of um, of um, behavior? And what's their attention span? What's their tolerance for losses? You know, their desire to hold. And probably, you know, these guys are in it for the short term. If their goal is to disrupt uh, big investors, then they probably don't have a long attention span. And therefore, we're going to see the sorts of activities that we've seen at the um, uh, the front half of this week. You know, huge price increases, huge price declines. And frankly, um, it's beyond my uh, brain capacity or beyond my capabilities to uh, to make money um, in, in that sort of volatility. For me, it would just be um, dumb luck, good or bad. Um, so our current view is that it will not have any significant impact on our 2021 view unless we start seeing these investors holding silver for the medium long term. So if we started seeing stories emerging of wanting to de-dollarize, you know, get yourself out of currency and hold on to um, physical metals, if we saw that emerging, that might change the story. But for now, we think this is a short term effect that won't impact our view. 
Um, what it will do for investors is you're going to see a risk-off mode coming in, which could dampen general commodity exuberance if it continued, which, you know, it's not our base view, but that could happen. And certainly, I think the one thing that has changed now across equities, commodities, whatever you like it, no one is going to want to be named as a dominant long or dominant short in the CFT, CFTC, the LME reports anymore, because it's, you know, it's gone from something that sort of helped that momentum to something that is going to be seen as a um, as, as a uh, petard to be sort of um, attacked. So I think you're going to see an evolution of the strategies to try and disperse that dominant long or dominant short strategy to make sure that it's not so clear that there's a you know such an attractive target to go after. Do you have a price forecast uh, for silver, like an average 2021 forecast? Yeah. Excuse me. So for for 2021, we expect silver to average somewhere between twenty four, twenty five dollars an ounce. So basically, where it is, or a little lower. Pretty much where it is, as it is at the moment, um, and so that you know that speaks to where we think there's um, a little bit of exuberance in the price. Um, there is, um, you know, there is on on silver's positive side. We've got the fact that um, we still think money is going to go into a safe haven status, and we do see um, a recovery in industrial demand. So it's winning on the fundamentals as well as the safe haven status. Um, we're expecting fabrication demand to increase by nearly six percent this year. So that's a fantastic growth number from the physical side, but. We're expecting mine supply to increase by nearly 9% this year. So you're going to see you know, a market that remains short-term, well-supplied or um, adequately supplied, which we think puts a little bit of a cap on the price increases. What will help silver in the medium term, so in the medium term, we remain bullish on silver, is we start to see, we think we start to see significant deficits coming into the silver market in the medium term. So once this phase of projects are completed, we can see in two to three years' time those deficits appearing, and if if people can bring that story forward, you know we could be a little bit um, a, a little bit uh, under in our price forecast for the back end of twenty twenty one into twenty twenty two. Do you see the gold price range bound or trading about where it is currently? So gold again, we're we're pretty much where we are. Um, we've got an average this year that's going to be something in the region of um, something in the region of um, two thousand dollars an ounce average. So um, you know, depending on how you play the numbers, uh, up up another um, up another um, 20 percent on on the uh, annual price for twenty twenty. Um, the bullish case for gold, you know, ongoing monetary easing, uh, more money in this system, potential inflationary pressures, and still we think having that safe haven status. Um, and I think as we talked about uh, last year, there's still going to be more money than maybe there's going to be um, credible investment um, pots to go into. So even if you are very positive on the recovery of the global economy, are you going to, uh, you know, are you going to completely take all your um, hold hold out of um, out of gold? Are you really ready to move into retail, to move into aerospace, to move into transportation yet? And so we think, even even with good economics, it's going to take a while yet before you get that that sort of risk off from gold. And therefore, we remain positive on gold for uh, you know throughout two thousand and twenty one. Paul, when I first uh, watched you give a lecture on commodities in 2017 as the keynote speaker at PDAC, I, re I was in the front row and I remember just the excitement or the anticipation building to what, okay, what is he going to say is the hottest commodity of the year? So what's the hottest commodity of the year? What are you most bullish on for 2021? Gosh, what am I most bullish on for 2021? So, the let's let's put it another way to start with. Um, let's let, let's let's build up some tension here, if you don't mind. So, if we take if we take 2020, um, we've seen a great recovery in 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 H2. But if you think about full year prices, which at the end of the day, of course, are driving the cash flow of the uh, of the, the the mining companies, you're looking at prices falling by nearly or over eight percent in 2020. That's a basket of 38 commodities just on a simple price uh, average weighted basis. So 8% decline. And actually more telling, of those 38 commodities, only seven of them registered an annualized year-on-year -year price increase. 
Um, and those seven were palladium, gold, silver, unsurprisingly platinum, so the PGMs. And then it was iron ore, copper, and ferrochrome. Don't ask me about ferrochrome. That's just one of our... I won't, I won't, <laughs> won't even know what question to ask. <laughs> so in contrast, this year, you know, we're expecting a 15, 1.5% average increase in that basket of commodities, 2021 over 2020. And um, of those 38, 34 of them are going to be um, in positive territory. So you can see that we're expecting a broad-based recovery that hits fertilizers, uh, bulk commodities, precious, the whole gambit for it to be there. Now, some of the strongest performers there are actually on a year-on-year -year basis, oil, copper, nickel, iron ore again. Um, as well as aluminum, silver. And then I think maybe what's particularly interesting to your audience as well, in addition to those broad performances, specific positive um, high performers, US steel and US aluminum prices. So there's a regional element here that's going to outperform from a global element as well. Is that because you assume an infrastructure package from Congress? So it's a couple of things. It's a really good question. The, the broad-based recovery is down to um, IP um, uh, returning, so IP of sort of 6.2% as opposed to a contraction of 4% previously. Um, the, you know, we shouldn't underestimate, you know, we've got the Chinese economy IP growing by 8% in 2021. That we haven't seen that level since 2015. You know, um, nobody thought, I certainly, nobody, I never thought it would ever reach 8% again because the economy is much bigger than it used to be in 2015. But the rebounding North American economy, because of some of those, um, some of those um, stimulus, um, combined with no significant easing of trade tensions, and we've seen Biden act on that already, that means that you're going to get a, a demand uh, pull within the uh, North American region, but there's going to be continued supply constraints or supply restrictions that mean U.S. steel, U.S. aluminum prices should perform particularly well. Trilogy Metals is a world-class developer in Alaska's Ambler Mining District. The company already possesses 8 billion pounds of high-grade copper, 3 billion pounds of zinc, over 1 million gold equivalent ounces, and over 77 million pounds of cobalt. Trilogy's Arctic project boasts an after-tax net present value of $1.4 billion with a 33% internal rate of return. Trilogy is led by an experienced management team with proven success in discovering and developing projects in Alaska. The company is well capitalized, has no debt, and possesses strong institutional support. Trilogy trades in New York and Toronto under the ticker TMQ. To learn more, go to TrilogyMetals.com. That's TrilogyMetals.com. You mentioned Biden because of the Biden win and now the Biden administration. Was there one commodity for the CRU group where your outlook really changed because of a Biden pres presidency? It, it hasn't. I guess um, the answer is no. But I guess the, the, the answer is our view didn't change and it could have done. So, um, and again, it comes down particularly to U.S. steel and U.S. aluminum. So, um, the view hasn't changed because those uh, those restrictions still remain in place. And if I give you a specific example, um, on the on his last presidential flight, uh, President Trump uh, removed the sanctions or the, um, uh, the 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 trade um, barriers on the UAE importing aluminum into uh, into the US. Um, I think within the last forty eight hours, uh, President Biden has reversed that and said no. You know, those trade barriers or those trade uh, restrictions will remain in place um, for security concerns. So it's interesting um, how much the previous president was pilloried for that and how much that's being used by the new administration now to say, no, continue for that reason. And therefore, at the moment, we don't see anything changing, uh, which means that domestic U.S. steel producers, uh, domestic and Canadian aluminum producers will um, benefit more in particular. Um, the American Rescue Plan is likely to help the whole broad gambit of um, commodities, whether it's foodstuff, energy, uh, metals, because it's going to the um, you know the most needy in the uh, U.S. economy, and it'll be quite widespread. Um, and the other thing that people talk about with President Biden is whether he'll invest in this green agenda. 
Clearly, it's going to be a lot easier to do that with his two Georgia um, Democratic uh, senators. We think there'll be an urgency to get that in place by the end of this calendar year, because if you don't get it in place by the end of this calendar year, you won't see the benefits for the next election cycle. But it's, you know, it's just not top of the agenda list at the moment. So it's too early to see whether that's going to have a particular benefit on the cobalt, the nickels, the coppers, the, you know, the, the, the battery metals yet, because I think it'll be a few more months before that gets formulated and we see what sort of deal he can do with Congress. How do you, uh, your analyst at CRU Group, when you're looking at what's going on and there's political and social unrest and there's things boiling in society, how do you analyze that or factor that into your analyst? You know, how is that going to affect supply and demand possibly? That's a tough question. Um, and, and it's a really relevant question as well. Um, so we, we try, I, I guess to start with, we try to think of it from as many different angles as possible. Um, I will get into specifics. The other thing we deliberately do as a company, we've got 300 people across uh, eight offices across the world. So if we want to know about, uh, you know, if we want to know about the uh, South American copper mining situation, let's talk to our Chilean, our Argentinian, our Brazilian analysts who work and live in that region, who have relatives that work in that industry. So it does give us a great advantage to be able to talk to those people and make sure that we're getting every view of the world, rather than there'd be nothing worse than 10 London-based white male analysts like myself sort of all thinking that we know the answer. So getting that aggregation of views is really important and makes a big difference to um, how we project our views. Um, more specifically, you know, if we take supply, we run disruption allowances like um, everybody does uh, to look at um, political social unrest. We do the trend analysis, which I'm sure you've seen before, where you know you can look at years where the um, copper price and margins are expected to be high, and whenever they coincide with a, a high rate of uh, unionized renegotiations, you know there's going to be higher levels of disruption. And you can see, you know, you you essentially have um, workers' years and owner's years, where you can see where that disruption is going to, um, you know, is more likely to fluctuate. Um, I've talked about trade tensions barriers. The two big things we're particularly focused on at the moment is this continued unease over the fair apportionment of wealth uh, within mining and ESG, and again, the changing societal attitude towards ESG. And both of these our best advice is to tackle those through scenario planning and to build them into whatever cost models or free cash flow models you're using at the moment. So we can alter the competitive position of individual assets by either changing um, trade barriers uh, and essentially uh, forcing them to reroute that product to a different market and seeing what that does to its competitiveness or we can apply CO2 costs and we can, again, we can, um, we, can re, um, we can reorder those cost curves and the competitiveness of those assets by putting different scenarios in place, barriers to entry in the EU or a green package by Biden or changes to um, quality standards into China. And nobody knows the answer, but running those different scenarios so that you can see how susceptible those assets are to small changes is the way that we try to um, look at that. That then feeds through to our demand models. So again, we look at that then to see how that impacts price and ultimately how prices of competing materials or prices of materials in the markets would then impact um, consumer demand at the end of the day and sort of iterate around. Does that make sense? It does. It does. Thank you for that thorough answer. And that analysis would play into your analysis of copper, I'm sure, because we often see union strike and things like that in, in South America or um, non-GMO, uh, NGO protests and things like that against those mines. So what do, you, what do you see the copper price going, I guess, is my question now. Where is the copper price going in 2021? Is it going to break through $4 and stay above $4 this year? So... I'm not going to be so crazy as to say that it's impossible to uh, go above four dollars a pound. Because I think you know, look where it is at the moment. I think last time I looked, it's, it was at sort of hitting three sixty, three seventy. So, um, so anyone would be crazy to say that. However, we don't think it will get that high this year. So, our, our base case is that copper will average 
about three uh, $3.40 a pound in 2021. Um, there's probably more upside risk than um, downside risk um, to that number. We are expecting a deficit this year. So we're expecting a physical deficit of about 210, 220,000 tonnes this year, which certainly aids the, um, the case for higher prices. Um, but we think prices, you know, we think the market is sufficiently um, is sufficiently supplied that we don't really see um, the we don't see what would be the next push to take prices and keep them sustained above four dollars a pound. Now, where could we be wrong? So I always ask the guy the guys to say, well, where where would we be wrong then? So they pointed out three things that could push it beyond four dollars a pound, and therefore, you know, my backstop of if we get it wrong, why might we get it wrong? You know, clearly, if there were unexpected supply problems um, at these prices, you would get, again get that uh, that that further surge. Um, if we saw additional retail investor pressure, so if we saw what we talked about in silver coming through to copper, it may not be sustained, but that could push it through. And maybe the one that is um, the the most interesting one to keep an eye on is we saw copper buying from the Chinese SRB, I think in Q3 last year. And if we saw a return to market from the Chinese SRB, that would certainly uh, provide a strong case to say prices could go north of our forecast because typically they buy, they hold for 12 to 15 months, they then release to the market uh, quite slowly over time. So I think that would be the thing that we're most conscious of keeping an eye on um, uh, and, and could cause us to upgrade our forecasts. But $3.40 average for 2021 is where we are at the moment. I think I have a scenario for $4 a copper that your analysts didn't think of, and that's we'll El- Elon Musk tweeting once a week, I'm ultra bullish on copper. That'll send it over $4, guaranteed. Uh, I'll, I'll call that additional retail investor pressure. But, okay. uh, you know, I'll, I'll, but, but no, I, I think I, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're 100% right. That sort of thing. He, um, se- he sent the Nickel Juniors just flying just by some of his uh, tweets and things he said last year. It's a very good point, though. It's a, it's a very good point. Um, yep. And it, it makes fundamental price forecasting uh, even more challenging and, re- and rewarding when we get it right. Yep, yep. <laughs> so on that note, uh, your view on Nickel, you know, with the EV revolution and Nickel's role in building out infrastructure and such, where do you see Nickel going? Um, so nickel is quite similar, really, in terms of um, in terms of expectations. So for an, on an annualized basis, we'll see prices going up, and they'll average something like seventeen thousand dollars a ton this year. But that's not, you know, that's pretty much where it is today. Um, so good prices again. We're seeing a limit to um, to where we see the upside in um, in 2021. Now that's not driven by demand, so we're expecting. Uh, we're expecting nickel consumption to rebound by nearly 10% this year. So it's not lack of demand. You know, we've got strong demand returning in 2021. Certainly the battery sector contributing to the, that, that demand recovery, but this is still a sector the nickel price is, is, is driven by stainless steel and the strength of China uh, you know, means we've seen very much a V-shaped recovery to that stainless steel production, which is sucking in those nickel units. So consumption is strong, but again, supply is just as strong. So in supply, we're seeing a 50% increase in the Indonesian nickel pig iron production this year, um, which will take us up to something like 900,000 tonnes. Um, and that is that is approaching, off the top of my head, that's approaching something like three quarters of the world's nickel pig iron production. So from a, you know, from a base of nothing, um, five years ago to uh, 900,000 tons is, is remarkable. Um, that means we're going to see the market in surplus again this year, 70,000 ton surplus. And again, we think that um, there's, there's enough support to keep prices where they are. You know, in, in other cycles, 70,000 ton surplus would um, lead to price declines, but we're not seeing a further sort of boost to um, prices beyond that 17,000 ton uh, level. So the price now, I believe, on nickel is about one third of where it was in the last peak. Do you, like how many years would you see a trending up towards that that number? Um, 
you have a multi-year forecast on it? Uh, we do. I mean, we've got prices trending up, but we've got them trending up in quite a smooth, uh, smooth manner. Nothing so, parabolic. Um, nothing parabolic. The, again, so far. So if you went back a couple of two, couple of three years ago, we'd have said the key risk to the nickel market on the upside would be the inability of the Indonesians to bring this nickel pig iron uh, processes online. Our view at the moment is they're doing it and they're doing it successfully. And therefore, the parallels are back to, gosh, probably 2012, 2013, when Chinese nickel pig iron first came out. Prices spiked to, you know, something like $40,000 a ton because nobody believed that nickel pig iron production was sustainable. And once everyone realized it was, those prices came off. And it looks like our call at the moment is it looks like that Indonesian nickel pig iron is coming on um, successfully. It's coming on pretty much to schedule, and therefore it's acting as a natural cap on prices compared to the last cycle. Dore Copper Mining is a premier, near-term, high-grade copper and gold redevelopment opportunity with tremendous exploration potential only 14 kilometers from the town of Shibugamu in mine-friendly Quebec. Dore Copper is debt-free and owns a 2,700 ton per day mill with an 8 million ton tailings facility ready to be used. There is already power to site and it is accessible by paved highway and rail. Dore Copper aims to produce a profitable hub-and-spoke operation of over 100,000 gold equivalent ounces per year or over 60 million million pounds of copper equivalent by 2024. Because of the existing infrastructure and location, a low capex is anticipated to recommence production. Dore Copper trades under DCMC in Toronto and under DRCMF on the OTC. To learn more, go to DoreCopper.com. That's DoreCopper.com. Oh, you mentioned you're bullish. Uh, I have a bullish outlook on iron ore. Is there anything more you can elaborate on that? Um. It's just you know again it's it's been the strength of the um, it's been the strength of um, demand in China, um, and it's been the inability of um, supply to um, to react to that particularly in Q three uh, Q four last year and you know um, partly related to the terrible um, the terrible disaster in in Brazil, we see that challenge remaining for the first half of this year. Um, we expect in the second half of this year, we expect to start seeing prices coming off back to more normal levels, if that makes sense. Um, still within three figures, but starting to revert. And we're starting to see um, the supply chain starting to normalize across the iron ore and particularly exports from Brazil, which should, should see the end of this peak. Um, what I will say is this will still be pretty much the highest margin commodity that we've got for the biggest proportion of volume. And it's still, you know, when you look at the profitability of the mining sector and you look at what's driving um, the availability of debt and the fantastic equity prices, gold, iron ore, copper, all remaining at decent prices, all remaining with a cost base because of the oil and the dollar and others that are relatively low at the moment. So, you know, all three of those are going to continue to be major revenue and um, profit earners for, for the big miners exposed to those sectors and the small miners on the gold side. One of the best performing commodities that you mentioned of last year was oil from like negative $42 a barrel to whatever it is now, $50, $55. So yeah. what's your outlook for the rest of the year on oil? You're going to see a similar theme here. So, so our average for the year is fifty-five dollars a barrel. Um, these were these were set at the back end of last year. Um, we've got you know we we've got oil gradually increasing over the medium term. So I think it goes up into the mid sixties over the next three to four years. Um, and we when I say oil, I say Brent crude, of course, that we've got at fifty-five dollars a barrel in twenty twenty-one. You know, the positives of the recovering global economy, the positives are the continued constraints in the Middle East. We've seen an extension of some of those cutbacks in the Middle East announced. Um, and Biden cancelling the Keystone Pipeline too, is that factored in? And Biden cancelling, yeah. I mean, that certainly helps in the medium term. Uh, it sort of helps in terms of um, capping um, potential capacity, new capacity coming forward. So you're absolutely spot on. Um, the things that go against oil at the moment, um, we still got a demand lag, you know, uh, transportation fuels, aviation and, um, and um, auto use are still going to be uh, subdued in 2021. And more of that, you know, economic recovery is going to be home workers like you and me rather than uh, commuters as we used to. So there's a, there is still a demand lag. 
and there is still significant oil capacity that's ready to return. And we think we just don't we we we're yet to believe, or the industry is yet to prove that it can maintain supply discipline above sixty dollars a barrel. So one of the key things we would look to see before we changed our forecast significantly would we'd want to see prices going above sixty dollars a barrel, and we'd like to see the industry turn around and continue to show um, capital discipline and continue to show, show um, supply constraint. And that's not proven yet. So we're, uh, you know, we're not as, um, we're not as, what's the word I'm looking for? We're not as convinced that that discipline is there that has been demonstrated in base metals and in some of the bulk commodities over the last uh, three to four years. And is being demonstrated in, in uranium, right? Where they just say, we're going to shut down our mine. <laughs> And has been demonstrated in uranium and has been demonstrated in lithium and a host of others where, you know, where maybe they've it's been forced upon them. But that that capital discipline gives you the it starts to remove the, the sort of caps from your price forecast or from our price forecasts. And you mentioned lithium. Where do you see lithium going? Some of those lithium miners have been just performing phenomenally the last couple of months. So from uh, I mean um, lithium, cobalt, nickel, all the spot prices have done really well in Europe in, in, in January. Um, lithium, we are least constructive of of the three. So uh, you know we're we're neutral on lithium this year. Uh, we've you know we 2020 was a terrible year for some of the lithium producers suffering financially, suffering from the markets. We did see the cutbacks. We have seen delays to future projects. So that is a um, that that's a good step. Again, our concern is there's overhang of capacity, particularly uh, in Australia, where there's a um, there's an overhang, and therefore we think that that's going to act as a cap on uh, prices this year. Um, give it another twelve months, and then we could start to see prices accelerating again. But uh, similar to oil, probably another twelve months of demonstrable supply discipline. Some of these um, assets coming out of administration now, or coming out of Chapter Eleven. How are they going to be operated now? You know, the worst thing I think for that market is if they uh, if all their debts have been wiped and therefore they they start with a clean sheet pumping out to the market again. So that we want to wait to see that before we become more constructive on lithium, um, unlike cobalt, where we are um, uh, uh, very constructive at the moment. It, what's your top battery metal you're most bullish on? Would it be cobalt? Uh, it would be cobalt. Yes. Uh, Interesting. And uh, we think it gives us the strongest fundamental position for price increases in 2021. Um, and actually, we're most constructive on cobalt in the medium term as yet as well. And we think that we're probably this year, you know, we're forecasting that this is the year that we get the start of another sort of multi-year increase from the, the price cycle. Um, and this is the... This is one of the commodities where we think uh, the prices need to induce more capital into mine development now to um, to uh, deal with the, uh, the 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 shortages in cobalt in sort of uh, three uh, three to four years time. Um, we think that we could be um, we could be a little bit late. So again, that's our price forecast. What could bring that price forecast forward? Um, there's a key need for projects like Matanda to return to market um, on time and on schedule. So if we see any delays to Matanda, which I think we've got coming in back end of this year, beginning of 2022, that could lift prices earlier. And similarly, we've seen some SRB stockpiling of cobalt. So again, if if we saw in, in, in additional activity there, again, that would bring that price cycle forward. But this is where we're we've got the most constructive view on that sort of that real start of that price cycle upwards again. Oh, just two more commodities, please. Uh, yeah. Aluminum. What's your outlook? Oh, aluminum. I love aluminum, but oh, goodness me. Um, so um, North American aluminum, I've said, very positive on North, on North American aluminum, and that will manifest itself in, you know, in the um, LME price plus the um, Midwest premium. More broadly, though, you know, globally, we've got prices, the LME price falling over the next two years. Um, and we've got a continuation in stock climb taking place that's driving that. Um, and 
this is a market that frankly just doesn't show a lot of um, supply restraints and you've got a Chinese economy that's booming at the moment. So we're unlikely to see um, that restraint coming from China, which is where it has to come to when it has such a um, such a large um, proportion of the world's um, capacity. So I'm afraid global surplus um prices needing to come down to a level that sort of um, take out some of that capacity. The good news story is, you know, uh, for, for the US sector, if, you, if, if you've got the rights to, um, to take metal into that sector, then you're, um, you know, you're probably shielded from that for, uh, for a certain extent. And last, fertilizers. You cover the fertilizers, uh, the phosphates. Is there any opportunity here for investors looking for a bullish sector? Yeah, so, so fertilizers as a whole so uh is 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 our most bullish for 20 uh, 2021 so we've got as a, as a sector as a whole we've got prices increasing i think by an average of um of uh, low 20 percent as a whole on a global basis um and that's for a couple of reasons so specifically um we're it's underpinned by chinese buying um, and you've got rallying agricultural commodity markets in China. We've got the reversal of the um, Asian flu swine um, crisis last year, which decimated stocks of, um, of pigs and um, other, other animals. And therefore, you've got the rebuild of those stocks and all of the um, agriculture based feedstock that drives that as one driver. The second driver is you've got U.S. corn, soybean prices. They're at multi-year highs at the moment. So again, we're expecting, you know, weather permitting, we're expecting to see um, really near record levels of crop plantings in 2021, which again will bring that demand for fertilizer products. And the third thing I guess I forgot to mention is um, more broadly, a lot of these stimulus packages around the world, whether it's been in, in the UK, in Europe, in the US, it's targeted towards those that need it the most. And those that need it the most spend more of their money on foodstuffs and those basic provisions, which, again, keeps that demand robust. So we've got a really strong demand story, we think, for three different reasons that will support you know, the, um, the, uh, the, the broad fertilizer um, prices in 2021. Um, I'll end on fertilizers just on one thing which we think is is will happen, which is directly interesting to uh, to your Canadian um, uh, listeners, is um, we think this will be the year that BHP Billiton will commit fully to Janssen, the Canadian potash project. So we expect to see that announcement this year, and um, we would expect to see um, them really start to uh, ramp up activity with a view to getting production online sort of 2027 something like that so really um, that 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 long term option coming into um, coming into play you know in in uh, in the next 5 to 6 years excellent well your twitter handle is at base metals on twitter but there are uh, family offices and fund managers that listen to the show so if they wanted to reach out to you paul how would they do that and um, they can DM me, dm me there or they can email me directly which is paul.robinson at crugroup.com. Excellent. Well, thank you for coming on today's show, Paul, and I'll be reaching out to you in about six months for an update. It's always a pleasure, Brill, you, and you ask brilliant questions. You've got a great followership, so um, I really uh, appreciate the opportunity to uh, speak today. 